we come to our last talk with Dr. Eric Apondo, who is a physician here in the oncology department um, of the University Hospital in Heidelberg and also holds an MA in medical ethics. He is coordinating and was coordinating the um, Pagoda study, the study where we set up um, together with patient representatives of the rare disease community and the cancer community deliberative forums and to learn how impactful patient involvement could look like and how that might inform a trustworthy governance. Yeah, thanks Eka, for the, the kind introduction. I don't know whether I have a piece of it higher up. Like has already been said, um, I would like to share a few things with you about the Pagoda project. Um, we have had a very eventful year and we have reached some very important milestones with the Pagoda project. And at the same time, we have also made in the past few weeks and months some very important um, strategic decisions that are going to be um, to affect the way forward, um, especially in the short and in the medium term. So I thought it would be a nice time to take stock of what we have done thus far, what we have achieved, and um, what we are looking forward to or what we are planning on doing now. So when we started two years ago, um, the annual meeting in 2021 was also in October, we had um, two main milestones that we were aiming for. And one was to um, have patient needs and their participation uh, or participation avenues uh, explored in a white paper and assess governance structures or our governance structure and see in um, which aspects it can be modified. There were two secondary um, milestones which had to do primarily with the work that um, we are doing in collaboration with the outreach team. One could actually argue that just about everything that we're doing with patient involvement is necessarily a part of outreach. Yeah? So that had to do with community engagement and with public outreach. And back then, I also showed this slide, um, which is just basically like a schematic that shows um, the relationship between patients and the public and um, GHGA and our partners, and the important role that we believe trust should play in our relationship with them. And on the one hand, up there, you have the ethical legal bounds, which are probably mainly represented by consent. But to operationalize, um, our work as an archive in data sharing, um, data collection and sharing, and especially considering the fact that we're aiming for getting more data and um, picking up more functionalities to operationalize, uh, to operationalize that, um, trust is very important. And looking at trust, well, one of the issues about it is of course, it's important for governance. But it's also a very complicated construct, especially considering the fact that you're dealing with a situation where you have diverse perspectives, different players who have different interests, and different levels of power or different perceived levels of power. And one of the things that we considered going into the project and which also affected how we designed the project, which methods we used to, uh, to conduct the study, was the fact that we believe that if different perspectives are involved, you get different voices, and you manage this perceived discrepancies in power, then it should be possible to get um, to get to a point where um, you have better implementation, better decisions that are being made, and you have different stakeholders feeling involved in the process, uh, which makes it more sustainable. And we believe that coming up with an adaptive um, kind of governance um, would definitely be important for that. And the basic idea behind it is all of these formal and informal um, ways to decision making within the institution. Uh, the idea is to kind of take away the locus of control from just the institution itself and its managers and to successively involve more and more people in decision making. And in this case, we started with the patients, but the goal would also be to involve the public, involve families, 
and involve other researchers in the governance process. There are three main things that are mentioned in the literature that are important for effectiveness of public or patient involvement in governance. And those are inclusion, meaning basically diverse voices, diverse views being involved in decision making, um, informed deliberation, because if you consider, for example, the work of genomics data archives and the ethical challenges that come with them, this is not information that is in the public domain. Not everyone you would ask on the street would tell you off the bat what are the ethical challenges that come with um, the work of genomics data archives. So if you want to get input from the public or from patients, it's important to first of all educate them about what issues are at stake. And of course, the last piece of the puzzle, which is very important, is influence, because you don't just want to have patients giving you suggestions and treating that like a to do um, a wish list, so to speak, which you can then, you know, you can pick and choose what is important to you. It's important that when the patients give their perspectives, that they actually have an impact on decision making going forward. So like I said, this was very important on how we designed the study and how we conducted it. Um, what I want to stress about this slide is the fact that we involved patient co-researchers researchers right from the beginning of the study. And they were part of the development of the study protocol. We conducted deliberative forums and the patient co-researchers were also key in developing the discussion guides for the forums. They were important for the recruitment process. And then we also conducted um, a consensus building dialogue event in which we then went over the issues in which there was um, um, discrepancy from the deliberative forums. And like I mentioned, just to go into the structure of how exactly we did it, um, at the top left there is the fact basically that we gave patients information about what we did. We made presentations also um, that also gave them a kind of background and a basis for what it was that uh, we were hoping that they were going to help us uh, make decisions about. So where are we now? Um, we finalized the white paper and it's now been published in Senodo uh, at the end of June. These are basically the processes that we went through um, to get there. And one of the things that is probably, uh, that I haven't mentioned yet, but was also very important in getting us to this stage is the fact that we also had a lot of feedback from GHGA. We had a lot of feedback from the directorate. There were a lot of meetings just to make sure that um, what we picture as being um, um, workable, a workable governance structure and what came from the patients that they're actually in step. Um, sorry. So like I said, we've already published the, um, the white paper. And um, what I would like to stress here is, it also has to do with something that also came up in the white paper as is mentioned there, acknowledgement and compensation of patients who are involved in research or in our governance. Um, the two patient co-researchers who were involved are also acknowledged as co-authors of this work. Um, the three other points that I think I'll just pick from this list uh, from the executive summary is the fact that, one, we agreed that with the patients that we would establish a patient advisory board. Like I said, that they would be compensated. Um, I would also like to stress something from that point. Um, as far as I know, all, well, I should frame that differently. All the patient advisory boards that I know of in Germany have individuals who are working on a voluntary basis. So the fact that we came to an agreement and also with the GHGA leadership, of course, that the patient advisory board or our representatives are actually going to be paid for their work, that's actually something new um, and something that I want to stress. It's really not something to be taken for granted. Um, and the other thing that we're also going to be working on going forward is that we have to um, cooperate with our data controllers going forward to come up with ways of operationalizing what we have already discussed in these forums, to come up with ways of um, having uh, patients or patient representatives involved more in data access procedures. Because as far as that is concerned, the GHGA is, um, has, has different procedures. And, and we have to consider that. So I think one of the very important things about this white paper is, um, well, there are two things. One of them is 
I think I can honestly say if I had had a document like this two years ago, the process of establishing patient involvement in GAG would have been a lot more simple. The thing is, um, if you look at the literature right now, there are bits and pieces of how you could go about a process like this, but it hasn't really been brought together in this kind of step-by-step, -step, um, if I could go back, approach so that if someone takes a look at the document, they would have an idea of what they should do, you know, from step one to step 10 or whatever. So I think that's a very important thing. And then um, secondly, just the process of how we went about it, the fact that we decided to use the deliberative method uh, means that we have established a kind of relationship with patients where we hope that even with the patients who took part in the deliberative forums, that we are going to be able to call on them later um, and when we have more functionalities within GHGA and there are questions that come up and we need input from the patient side that we're going to have this input um, from other people other than just the, the patient advisory board. So I think that is definitely a plus um, considering the, the, the method that we, that we went about um, getting the job done. Parallel to all of that, we've also been spreading the word about what we are doing, about the method, uh, about the deliberative method, about um, the fact that patient involvement is important, about the parameters under which we are um, getting into patient involvement. Like I mentioned, the fact that um, our patient representatives are going to be paid um, and that kind of thing. And we have also kind of targeted different audiences like at the single cell omics um, uh, conference last year, the focus was mainly on researchers. Um, at the CORDI conference about two or three weeks ago, the focus was mainly on other consortia. And the fact that the approach that we used can also be transferred to other consortia in other disciplines, not just in genomics or um, in health data management. And we are going to be targeting patients um, in about three weeks at the, at the German Cancer Research Congress. So looking to the future and what we're trying to get done. So we're pretty much now in the implementation phase and the implementation phase, um, as far as I see it, can be has pretty much three arms. The first part is the recruitment of the patient advisory board and recruiting personnel who are going to support that process. The second part is um, management, um, onboarding of the patient advisory board, um, kind of getting into, into, the, um, into the flow and workflows within GHEA and evaluation of, of our work. Because one of the things that is also generally missing or, or rather scant in the literature is the fact that um, there are sometimes efforts to involve patients in research, mainly governance is um, um, a bit newer, so to speak, but uh, not really information about what benefit that has. So that's going to be one of our focus, uh, a focus um, going forward to make sure that we actually have some kind of um, um, evidence of, of what, what benefits uh, patient involvement in governance has. So looking at it at um, the recruitment part, um, like I mentioned, the focus is to recruit these four individuals for the patient advisory board. And I've just tried to um, kind of um, um, divide that into indicators and, and products. And one of the main things that we'll be looking at is coming up with a clear job profile or position profile for the individuals who are going to uh, take over this position and then start off with the recruitment process. Um, one of the interesting ideas that we had from the deliberative um, forums or rather from the um, consensus building dialogue event was the possibility of having a patient pool that goes over and above the, the, the four, individual in, uh, four individuals in the patient advisory board um, so that you have this, I'll call them patient advisors who you can reach or who you can con connect with researchers in the event that there are either studies in which they should be involved in or just general questions that uh, where you'd like the input um, to be um, to be fed into the decision making process, and of course it would probably make sense to come up with a means of, uh, like I said, connecting researchers or connecting institutions to this patient pool, and that would probably be either through the um, our website or 
the patient or GA patient website for some kind of portal for getting that done. As far as management is concerned, um, that's actually something that we've already started to get done in uh, cooperation with the outreach team, uh, recruiting someone who is going to be, um, like I said, um, taking up the onboarding of the patient advisory board and also um, um, liaising with them in coming up with training materials, um, working on the GHEA website. And uh, we've already got job applications for, um, for this position. Uh, we've already conducted interviews, that's why it's in gray. And uh, one of the indicators for that is of course going to be, um, we'll be starting with patient advisory board meetings, um, meeting with the directorate and with the teams. And of course, at some point, they're going to have to come up with rules of procedure. And as far as evaluation is concerned, don't ask me why that is in German. Um, um, one of the things that we have to figure out is, of course, what it is that we want to evaluate. But like I said, there are a lot of aspects of it that, um, that can and should be evaluated, um, starting with uh, the contribution of the patient representatives once they're in the advisory board, um, the requests that we get, what kind of requests we get from the researchers, um, what kind of questions we have from GHGA or from other institutions in which we meet them, what are the barriers and facilitating factors for the patient advisory board and the work that they're doing, the satisfaction of GHGA and researchers. Um, but that's obviously something that we're going to have to start looking at once we have uh, the recruitment phase done. So this is, again, like a just a, a general um, diagram to show how we're going about it. And of course, it's not just the white paper and implementation phase of it that we're working on, but um, there are, of course, publications that are being worked on um, with the results and with the methodology that we picked, which, like I said, um, we feel is important that other institutions also get to hear about, and other corporations that we'll also be eyeing um, going forward, um, especially as far as building competencies of patients and of the patient advisory board is concerned. And of course, we want to keep all of this within uh, what you see on the bottom right there, uh, what we think are important parts of, of a reasonable or a trustworthy governance structure, but we keep making sure that they have influence, that they're included in decision making, and that they are informed about, um, about the questions that we have. So, like I said, um, the patient participation is not just going to the patient advisory board itself, but we hope with time to, in time to come that we also have this patient pool and that we'll keep working on training and evaluation. And of course, like I mentioned, um, bringing in other stakeholders, the researchers coming up with tools or using the tools that we have to connect them um, um, via the website or portals. And also adding on the experience that we already have with the deliberative method uh, to involve patients and other researchers in um, coming up with um, different tools, different frameworks that are going to be uh, necessary going forward as far as governance is concerned. And we expect that all of this is going to have a lot of benefit, not just for GHGA, like I mentioned, but also for researchers and for patients. Um, of course, the patients are going to be involved in the work that we're doing. They're going to be um, educated um, or trained. Uh, there'll be opportunities for them to network with other patient organizations. Uh, for researchers, of course, uh, we hope that through the training that we're going to do for the patient advisors that we have and for the patient advisory board, that researchers, um, downstream researchers who get data from us and who do not have uh, patient uh, support, um, they should be able to turn to us for that kind of um, advice or help, including grant proposals, um, um, coming up with uh, um, um, research questions for their work because patient involvement is becoming or is already a policy or a key policy objective um, um, as far as research is concerned. And uh, in many cases in time to come, most researchers are not going to be able to get funding for their work without patient involvement. So we hope they're going to be able to support them with that. 
And um, finally, uh, as far as documentation is concerned from the legal side, there's work that is being done on um, code of conduct. And we hope that we're going to be able to involve um, the patients or the patient advisory board in developing um, a code of ethics that they're going to be a part of that. So in summary, um, we've surpassed our milestones at um, 24 months. The project design that we picked um, supports or fosters inclusivity within GHGA and with our stakeholders because pretty much the same effort uh, or the same method could also be used for um, um, similar initiatives also with researchers um, or with other partners within GHGA. Uh, one of the things that I also stressed in the um, NFDI conference or the CORDI conference about two or three weeks ago was the fact that the approach that we took is transferable to other disciplines. And uh, like I said, it's also relevant for the work that we're going to be doing with other stakeholders. And we are focusing now on recruitment of the patient advisory board and support personnel within GHG. Thank you.